Happy New Year! I'm a little bit worried about the lighting because it is extremely dark in my room right now and I am hoping that my phone will be able to capture whatever scans lighting is filtering through my bedroom window. So as you can see, I have moved houses. I'm in my new room now. It has been an extremely painful process. I do not want to move house again but I'm gonna have to do it in like a few years when my own flat is done. The past three weeks, I have just been getting this room ready. Only just a few days ago, I finally unwrapped my mattress so I don't have to sleep on a plastic mattress anymore. It took a while for the shelving to come in, it took a while for the other shelving to come in, it took a while for like, the curtains even to come in, so there were just a lot of things that were not ready. My bookshelves are not yet done, I have not unpacked my books from the boxes. Yeah. So, because I was really busy moving house, I didn't really get the chance to read as much as I usually did. This month, I only read like three and a half books. I'm not even done, even though it's already the end of the month. But it's okay. I think I'll be able to somewhat reach my reading goal of 50 books this year. Maybe during like the holidays. Okay, so anyway, the first book that I read is The Woman in White. I was supposed to read it chapter by chapter, but I got impatient. Like, I was just so tired, waiting for the updates to come in. I was like, this cannot do. So I went to go and borrow the, the book itself, and then I just read it in four days. <laughs> I feel like it's quite an accomplishment because I didn't realise it when I was reading it chapter by chapter but the whole book itself was actually quite long. I was like, oh this story is like never ending uh. like, I just keep reading and reading and then the, the plot just keeps twisting. Eventually, finally, I reached the end and I was like, oh wow, I made it. It's like 900 pages or something. This book was really a pleasant surprise to me. Generally, I wouldn't say that I am somebody who reads a lot of classics. I read a lot for school but I'm not like one of those people who make it a point to go and read a list of classics before I die or something like that. It's just, it's not really me and I feel like there is no need to really uh, acknowledge the canon. We can always make our own canon, so that's my belief. But I do love horror novels and especially if there's like a really good mystery behind it. When I was reading this book, what really hooked me was the unreliable narrator. It took it the form, it, yes? Yeah? Yes, baby. What is it? Yes? You wanna come here? Yeah? Come on. Why are you so noisy? Yeah. What's wrong? What's wrong? Hmm? What's wrong? You okay? What's wrong? Kiss, kiss. Okay. Whoa. Okay, I don't know what my cat wants. Uh, I think he just wants to be involved. Okay, relax. Now you want you want a drink? You want? Okay. My cat is very needy. Oh, that's okay. I accept him for who he is. All right. Oh no. The chapters, instead of being like a written from a third person narrator point of view where the narrator knows everything that's going on, the story came in the form of letters and diary entries. It was very like giving a unreliable narrator kind of vibe that I really enjoy. <laughs> Um, I like that the characters don't know what's going on and therefore because you are reading their diary entry or because you are reading like an account written by them or you are reading like a letter written to them by somebody else, you also don't know what is going on. You have no choice but to figure things out with the characters as they figure things out. I know that this book was like a huge hit back when it came out. Funnily enough, even now, even in the year 2023, I found myself uh, not entirely impervious to the charms of such a book and even though every Everything is so melodramatic and the villain is just so villainous and the good people are just such goody goody people. You you just kinda kinda wanna watch it. It just has that mass appeal that I feel like a lot of books don't really have anymore. I read um this writer's other book before, The Moonstone, and you know like when you look at the Moonstone, it is like a tome, right? 
it just does not look like something that you want to get into but once you get into you cannot put it down of course like because the book was written so long ago it has a messaging that people would say is problematic now so for example if you were to read the moonstone the description of the foreigners is low key or even high key very racist the whole thing like centers around this magical moonstone that belong to some kind of emperor in India and then there is a cult that is dedicated to getting it back and then every time like you know these hunters like show up they are described as like wearing turbans and they are very sinister characters it would not pass the 21st century vibe check for sure similarly for the woman in white its portrayals of mental illness or schizophrenia or anything related to like you know one's nerves is definitely not uh, the most politically correct and then for some reason like this idea of being mentally ill translates into being physically ill so you have one character who basically is uh, eccentric since birth and then when she grows up she becomes a very eccentric adult and then people are like describing her as being weaker in the mind and naturally because she's weaker in the mind she's also weaker in the body right so like her heart like stops one day and then she dies okay lor <laughs> It doesn't make sense. This kind of book doesn't need to make sense. It needs to make sense internally. There needs to be like an internal logic that keeps the plot going. But rationally, if you compare it to like what we know about science in real life, it doesn't need to make sense in that way. I gave this book a 4 stars. Not because it's like uh, the best written book, but because it's just so funny. Like the people are just so funny. Characterization is like excellent because the way the villain talks is hilarious. I mean naturally it's because he's Italian, right? So once again, there is that making fun of foreigners thing going on again in this Wilkie Collins novel. Even the way that the protagonist describes a woman, this woman has very nice posture, this woman has a very nice aura and then she turns around and he's like, oh this woman is ugly. <laughs> you will not get writing like this anymore like, nowadays, that's all I can say. I took a very long break between my first and my second book because I was busy packing and moving house uh, and then I was like, no 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 no, I cannot, I need to read something to sort of give myself uh, a reason to continue living. My will to live was at an all-time low. So I decided to read a book that I kept seeing on physical bookshelves but I've never actually gotten the chance to read. It's called Piranesi by Susanna Clark. This writer, I think I read one of her books very long ago, back when I was in like secondary school. It's called like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. The thing is, I read it, it was a thick ass book and I read it all, but since I read it so many years ago, like half my lifetime ago, I don't remember it anymore. I'm not sure if she's written other books, but all I know is she's known for these two books. Kind of like a hotly anticipated novel by this novelist who we were not sure whether she was just a one-hit wonder, but she's not because this second book turned out to be pretty good too. Piranesi, like The Woman in White, is written from the perspective of the unreliable narrator. Once again, there is no omniscient narrator and the story is told entirely in the form of this guy's diary entries. But this guy, he doesn't exactly seem to be of this world. He describes his environment and it just sounds extremely bizarre. He's like, I live in a house and there are a lot of rooms and in the rooms there are tides and I measure the tides and there is a guy who comes in and you know his clothes are very nice I'm not so sure where he gets them and he's very nice to me he's my friend he takes care of me he gives me things when I need them I guess like the nice things that he gets are from the house itself because the house is this kind of like religious deity that he worships and lives in and he venerates he's a child of the house and this house uh, takes care of him and, and looks out for him and provides for him and he's like I have everything I need in this house. If I'm hungry, I can go and fish. If I need anything, I can make it out of seaweed. So, um, I think from the start, it's already very clear that this guy is not entirely hinged. He's not unhinged and his friend is clearly a suspicious character. Our protagonist is basically living like a caveman. He's eating seaweed, he's eating fish that he caught from don't know where, he is going around foraging and hunting food like all the time just to stay alive, he's like making fires to keep himself warm. And this other guy is wearing nice shoes, he's wearing a nice suit, he doesn't seem to spend any time at all doing things for his survival.
survival. So it's very suspicious, right? Yeah lah, he turns out to be a, a bad guy, naturally. In fact, uh, almost everyone turns out to be a bad guy. But I think like, even though the story ended up being kind of predictable, the world building was still quite impressive. It was very cinematic. As you are reading it, you can almost imagine the different rooms, you can imagine the flood, you can imagine the statues that he describes in great detail. You start to become very invested in his well-being. You want him to sort of survive and make it out of this place. I think like as a concept, the idea of the house itself is very interesting. I can totally see this book being studied in a class where we talk about this search for meaning. That's what the scientist was doing. He was searching for meaning. He was searching for something to unlock a higher power, to grant that power to him. He was trying to make sense of something in order to conquer it but he ends up not respecting it and as a result he pays for it with his life on the other hand our protagonist who may not be approaching this situation as scientifically as we would like to he is in a way protected and blessed he becomes a native of sorts that gains him access like if we were talking about this idea of transcendence of seeking like higher power higher knowledge the protagonist himself in his adult amnesiac state even achieves transcendence way more than the scientist ever could and I feel like this book is a little bit meta in the way that it comments on this need to look for meaning, to look for like a definitive answer, to look for something to quantify and to measure rather than to just simply experience it. I'm not sure if I'm like reading too deeply into it, but as I was reading, especially in the earlier chapters, that was the, the vibe that I was getting. Yeah, why is my cat so noisy? Book 3 that I read, Strange the Dreamer by Taylor Liney. I saw that the reviews on Goodreads were pretty high, so I kind of had high hopes for it. I was hoping that it would be good enough to maybe distract me from the misery of everyday life, and I would like to say that it has. As I was reading it actually halfway through, I was like, oh, this is a 5 star novel, this is a 5 star novel. Finally, I have another 5 star novel. But then like towards the end, it got like uh, a bit predictable, a bit heteronormative, and then I was like, never mind, never mind. It's like a 4.5 star. So I rounded it down and gave it a 4 stars. And then on top of that, it ended on like a cliffhanger. Ironically, right, I read this as an ebook version. And then when I went to look for the second book, there was like a, a 16 week wait. Huh? Why? Why is it that the first book I could borrow immediately? And then for the second book, there's a 16 week wait. I was like upset. I was pissed right so i went out to get the second book the physical one from the library itself here it is yeah okay you look at how thick it is like look at that okay so the ebook version itself is also like maybe like 900 pages long i feel like it's very manageable it's about like like that law it's really like this law how many pages here this is a 500 page book that's really manageable. So Strange the Dreamer is a fantasy novel. As I was reading it, I was just really struck by how reminiscent it was of the old-fashioned kind of fantasy novel. I'm not talking about like the contemporary kind of fantasy novel with like the YA angle. I don't mean this like disrespectfully or derogatorily. I enjoy YA. So the thing is, a lot of YA, they have like the same flavor. And then if you read the older fantasy novels, maybe even books like Magician or maybe like Orson Scott Card older novels, it has a different flavor. And this book, I feel, it does a very good job of combining both flavors. So as I'm reading it, I was very surprised to find out that it was published recently. I was like, eh? It was published in this century. If you had told me it was a novel from like the 80s or 90s, I would have believed you. The approach towards the world building and towards the character characterization was very old-fashioned until it reached towards the end then there was like the romance factor coming in and then I was like okay this is definitely a contemporary novel the, the romance part la, it started to feel more like an ordinary YA novel afterwards this book centers around a guy called Laszlo Strange because Strange is his last name given to him by the monastery that took him in when he was nothing but a war orphan you have this monk like character who clearly goes through a lot of childhood trauma and he was raised in a very strict environment where he was getting beaten and stuff and it's basically like child abuse in that kind of like monastery environment right because you have so many babies in mind one dies then you just replace with another one lo. he didn't have any sort of like ego or pride all he just wanted to do was to read books indulge in his fantasies of this other city that disappeared 
200 years ago. So the city of Weep. He sort of like became a scholar of Weep. So you know like the story is starting to seem like a very classical hero's journey kind of trope. He does a lot of research on the city of Weep and then he tries to write his own books. At the same time, there is like a foil to his character. This guy called Theron Nero. He's a duke's son, but he's the godson of the queen. And he's an alchemist. And his job is to figure out how to transmute common metals into gold. Theron Nero is like the complete opposite of Leslo. Throughout the entire novel, we are reminded constantly that Theron Nero is the guy destined for greatness. He's destined to be a hero. He's going to be a savior. The legends are going to be written about him while Leslo is going to be forgotten by history. There is nothing significant about Leslo. The only thing he can do is maybe to contribute to Theron's story the best he can and then just disappear. And Theron himself is a, a bit of a son of a bitch lah. When I was reading it, all I wanted to do was just punch the guy in the face, right? And this is another old-fashioned sort of trope, right? Where the underdog that you kind of root for and then he's being bullied by this guy that everybody loves and you just can't wait for the guy to get punched in the face and you can't wait for him to die a horrible painful death. So far so good. The story uh, takes a a turn that I totally did not see coming and I feel like you should go and read it on your own but I will talk about it after I have finished reading book 2. You can tell that this book is extremely extremely popular because the cover is completely faded already. This is supposed to be like foil you know like foil and you look at the back it's like falling apart eh. This book is like on its last legs already. On my TBR I kind of have like four books physical ones and I'm halfway through through this book called Dandelion. I actually had it on hold for a while and then finally it was my turn to get it so I clicked borrow and then I was like hmm it's a bit longer than I expected. If all goes well next month I will be able to read five books maybe even six or seven if I can magically create the time to read them. That's my wish for February. <laughs> so that's it for now. Happy New Year! I hope that January has been better for you than it has for me and I will see you next month. Bye bye!